Um, for those who have been on every call, forgive me, it's a bit of a repeat, but we have new participants every week, so we like to, to give the background either way. Uh, we will have a question and comment section at, after our speaker today, so hang tight. You're welcome to put them in the chat if you'd like to do it that way. We are recording this call so that other people who can't be on with us today will be able to enjoy it another time. I um, work here at Villa Gardens in Pasadena, and we have some non-Villa Gardens people here. That's why some of the Villa Gardens residents must be wondering why I say that every time, because there are some non-Villa Gardens people who join us. Um, so in the fall of 2018, a Villa Gardens resident, Nan Johnson, wave Nan, um, <laughs> wanted to make sure that everyone celebrated the centennial of the passing of the 19th Amendment in the year 2020. She gathered a small group of women in Pasadena and the idea of celebrating on January 1st with a rose float in the Rose Parade was born. Maybe you saw that float. It was called Years of Hope, Years of Courage. It had Lady Liberty riding high in the center of the float with 18 prominent figures on the float and 100 men and women walking behind the float dressed in white, reminiscent of a suffrage parade. Our featured speaker today was one of those walkers. Many celebrations have been stalled due to COVID-19, but with Nan and a different small group, we recently gathered to discuss continued celebrations. We call ourselves 2020 Plus and are starting with this speaker series at Villa Gardens during the month that the 19th Amendment was signed. It was mentioned earlier that tomorrow the 18th was the, um, the day of the Tennessee vote, the final ratifying vote. And then we have people also celebrate August 26th when, the, um, when it was signed into law. And maybe our, our speaker might tell you more about that. Nan Johnson, the inspiration for all of this celebration, spent much of her life in Rochester, New York, the home of the suffrage movement. She served in the legislature on Monroe County for 20 years, taught at the University of Rochester, and was the founding director of the Susan B. Anthony Center at the University of Rochester. She also had close civic ties to Seneca Falls, the home of the National Women's Hall of Fame and Women's Rights National Park. Many more accolades than I can list here, but without further ado, Nan, take it away. So you'll have to un, yeah, there you go. Have I unmuted myself, I think, as much as I am capable of doing? Yeah, all right. Okay, um, this is Nan Johnson. I'm delighted to be here and to welcome you all here again uh, to this series. Uh, this particularly, we wanted to have a series in August for uh, 2020 plus because that is the month when the whole thing really came to fruition. I am privileged to be able, and as well as having a great pleasure to introduce to you Deborah Hughes. And um, I'm not going to talk very much about Deborah because I want her to be able to tell you herself about what happened here. But I do want to tell you that when I came to Rochester in 1957, you know, the house was there. And I mean, we knew about Susan B. Anthony and some of the uh, history, of course, and, and I got very involved in Seneca Falls. But believe me, believe me, no matter what Deborah says, there, the house was in no way the way it is today, and it was not the national treasure that it is today, the international treasure. And, and all the, um, the connections that Deborah has made there, she started when she came in 2007. And I mean, it's, it's uh, it, obviously, Obviously, I am much older than she, but we are uh, kindred spirits on this, I am privileged to say. And um, she uh, has just done a, a marvelous job with uh, making the, the whole history of, of the suffrage movement through Susan B. Anthony and the relationships in Seneca Falls with uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Frederick Douglass and all of it. So I'm gonna give it to uh, Deborah because I want her to be able to talk to you about all of this as, as, and give you some background on it. Deborah, here you are, dear. Thank you so much, Nan, you're very, you're very kind. So greetings to all of you from Rochester, New York. The uh, images behind me are of the National Historic Landmark and Susan B. Anthony's sister Hannah's house, which we acquired in the late 1990s as our visitor center. It's a quiet street on Madison, 
And if you were a suffragist at the turn of the century, you'd know about Madison, that place that was the home and the headquarters when Susan B. Anthony was president. And things were sent often. When Susan was at a national convention, they'd be sending new carpets to Madison because Susan and Mary, her sister, were known for spending all their money on the cause and not so much on their own uh, comfort. Uh, and every time you got a letter from Susan B. Anthony, and she was able to keep three stenographers, full-time stenographers, busy taking dictation when she was president of NASA. This is a woman who sent 1,600 thank you notes to those who attended her 80th birthday party. If you got the letter, it would come right from Madison Street. And so this modest home, as one person described it in 1945, a, a modest home on a narrow lot in a gone to seed neighborhood is the National Historic Landmark where we can claim this history and heritage of Susan B. Anthony's head work headquarters. It's also the house where she was arrested for voting in 1872. And it's where she died in 1906, having worked until the last weeks of her life, still working to uh, work for the vote for everyone. So it's wonderful to uh, welcome you in this virtual way to where we are here in Rochester. I wanna take you back a little bit to Susan B. Anthony's time in 1820 when she was born. Because if we really understand the setting and the context of her life, I think it adds more meaning to the work that she did and also gives us both hope for so much that has been accomplished and also uh, helps us recognize the very difficult work and challenges that were ahead. In 1820, of course, this was a new democracy. The Republic was only about 50 years old and the world kind of thought this was a crazy experiment. No place else had there dared to be a government government that was selected by those who were governed. And as we know, the incredible visionary words that we found in the Declaration of Independence and in that first constitution were all about equality and empowerment and God's gift of, of human rights and the, the human striving for life, liberty, and the pursuit and happiness. But the world into which Susan B. Anthony was born was not a world where everyone had those rights. For women who happen to be white women, Eurocentric women, if you got married, all of your property now became your husband's property. It had been your father's. You didn't have custody of any children. Those were his children. You couldn't enter into a contract because the law literally said when two are married, the two become one and the one is the man. Hence that old change where Jane Doe marries Fred Smith and becomes Mrs. Fred Smith, that actually was because Jane Doe ceased to exist in the eyes of the law in the 19th century. So what that meant was you couldn't rent your own apartment, you couldn't enter or sign a contract for a business. You, If you happen to have been trapped in a marriage that had substance abuse and alcoholism, which was rampant in the 19th century, you couldn't leave because if you did, you had to leave your children behind and your husband could actually indenture your children into servitude to pay his bar bill. Not just the ones who were already born, but those who had not yet been conceived. Now, that's pretty oppressive. And a lot of people who come to visit the Anthony Museum who look like me right there already say, how come nobody told me this? Why didn't I know this history? But that doesn't even begin to talk about what the circumstance for women in these United States was in the 19th century because we haven't addressed those who were trapped in slavery. Those who were, as because of the chattel slavery that was allowed and permitted, and when Susan B. Anthony was born, New York State still allowed slavery. Uh, the world where we had human beings who were considered to be less than human, and where one person could own as property another person's very life and being. This was the condition for many, many women who were on these borders at the time that Susan B. Anthony was born. And then there were indigenous women women who were native peoples across the country from many different tribes and groups. Some who in our own region in Central and the Finger Lakes in New York State seem to have inspired some of the whole women's rights movement because the Haudenosaunee and Seneca, the Tuscarora, all had cultures where the women could own property and did have power. And even in those where the chiefs of the nation were men, they were elected by the women and could be deposed by the women. And yet, 
These were women and children who were taken off their property, who were slaughtered and massacred, whose treaties were violated, who were mistreated, abused, and put through horrific indignities in the early stages of this country. So when we start to think about, gee, what was life like when Susan B. Anthony came onto the scene? To me, it is very exciting that we are finally truthfully taking a broader look and understanding at what society and what the world was like in that time period. And in the same way, we're taking those eyes wide open and looking what life is like truly in our society today. Now, I'm going to put forth the thesis that Susan B. Anthony is quite a patriot. I think she is an old school liberal who actually believes that this crazy experiment of having a country where the citizens can elect their government despite the risks involved, because what that means if you let everybody vote and participate is that the crazy people as well as the thoughtful people get a voice and a vote. And as we all know, sometimes good triumphs and sometimes it's not good that triumphs. But Anthony, I believe, passionately believed that it was the only model to provide opportunities for true human rights and, and life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and that there had been no other model before. But now here's Susan B. Anthony trying to figure out how to get from where they were to where she thought we would be. Susan B. Anthony was a Quaker, as some of you know. Now there's currently seven different groups of Quakers and we often have understandings and presuppositions about different religious groups based on our own experience. But in the 17th century, the Quakers had been persecuted in Wales and England and even put to death. Many of the Quakers who found their way to these shores and hoped to have religious freedom really didn't intend to have religious freedom for everyone. They wanted religious freedom for the Quakers. And we see that all up and down in the 13 colonies. The colonies that were Catholic didn't intend to have Protestants in their midst, and the Congregationalists didn't want to put up with the, uh, the Catholics, and they didn't want to put up with the Quakers. Uh, in Massachusetts, in the 17th century, there were Quaker women who dared to teach Bible study. And they taught it to promiscuous assemblies. And a promiscuous assembly is a lovely term for an audience where there's a man and a woman sitting in the audience. And because of the way that they read the Pauline prescription and that said that a woman should never have authority over a man, it was appalling that a woman would dare to teach and assert authority over a man. But the Quakers had an understanding that every human being has within themselves both an obligation and a duty and a direct connection with the Creator. And so that life has a purpose and that purpose is vocation to align oneself with something grander and greater and more significant than ourselves. Now, by the time we get to the 1830s, the Quakers have split over very important question. And that's the question about what to do with the horrific institution of slavery. Some Quakers believed that you shouldn't have anything to do with government. In fact, they didn't believe in voting. I'll just let that sink in for a minute. So some Quakers didn't believe that you should vote because if you voted, you were supporting a government that spent its money on war and violence and participated in the capitalist economy and you could not avoid being corrupted just by participating in the government by voting. And they believed that the best way to establish a beloved community was to isolate themselves from all of the sin and corruption a huge part of the responsibility for the community was placed on the women. In fact, the Quakers believed that it was better for a young woman never to marry than for her to marry outside of the Quaker meeting. This is one of the reasons why girls like Susan B. Anthony and her sisters, Gwelma and Mary, were taught to be teachers because it would be better and it was necessary for a woman to have some way of providing for herself if she wasn't supposed to marry somebody outside of her own religion. Now, in Massachusetts Colony, where I started, there's a woman named Ann Hutchinson and there were others. They're teaching Bible studies and they actually got thrown out of the colony. Off to Rhode Island they went where there were all those crazy people who did believe in religious liberty. But 
gosh, they felt compelled to come back and teach the Bible. And again, they got thrown out, and again, they come back. To me, this is important, because ultimately, there were Quaker women in Massachusetts colony who were put to death for having dared to lead Bible studies. When we have Susan B. Anthony, about 70 years later, daring to go to every county in New York State, 62 of them, to speak as a single woman in opposition to the horrific institution of slavery, it helps for us to have that context, that women who had dared to do something very similar and from her own tradition just a generation and a half before had been put to death for daring to cross that gender line in society in the United States of America. Now, Susan B. Anthony first was a teacher, as I already mentioned. She ended up going to teach in 1838 after her father went bankrupt in the big stock market crash. It was such a devastating loss to the family that we have records that show that her mother's petticoats and spectacles had to be auctioned to pay off her father's debt. Susan comes out of school and goes to work and becomes a pretty good teacher and gets pretty frustrated very quickly that she's making a quarter for every dollar that a man makes. She rises to the pinnacle. Her students are getting awards and she's getting awards. And in New York State, if you are a woman and you're sick, you're expected to pay your substitute. If you're a man and a teacher and you're sick, the school district pays for your substitute. Already, by the mid-20s, Susan had found that the career that she had trained for, she had done, she had gone as far as she could go, and she didn't find a way to be able to sustain herself. In fact, in most cases, you were a single woman, because of course, if you were married, you couldn't work any longer. And someone from the school would allow you to live with them. In her case, it was her uncle. And there you would be protected from all of the crazy things that might happen to a young woman out in society. But in addition to being the ruler over the schoolhouse, you would be the housekeeper and the babysitter in the home that provided room and board for you for your limited wage. Well, Anthony gives up teaching and she gets interested in her first social justice cause and that is temperance. Right. Now, I already mentioned that in the 19th century, alcoholism was rampant. People were dying from cirrhosis of the liver in their 30s. And we all know that with substance abuse comes more domestic violence. And now you've got women who are trapped in untenable situations and couldn't get divorced. And if they do leave, they are ostracized by society and they can't rent a place because they can't sign a contract. I believe for Anthony, her passion about temperance, about teaching about all things in moderation and speaking against the the vice of drinking was largely a social justice issue for the freedom of women. The family migrates to Rochester, New York, and Anthony eventually ends up there with her parents. And we have some wonderful letters, one where she's sitting out at the family farm. And the family farm, which is now about a mile and a half from where the house is, the Anthony house, uh, was a 25 acre farm. It was actually owned by her uncle because her father had never really recovered from his bankruptcy in the 1830s. And at that farm, they are a hub of abolitionist activity. Her father is very much engaged and he introduces her to Frederick Douglass, who was a frequent guest at the farm on Sunday afternoons, bringing with the family and the fiddle. And there she meets William Lloyd Garrison and John Brown. Susan B. Anthony's two younger bro brothers, two Quaker boys actually go to Kansas to fight in the bloody Kansas wars with John Brown to assure that Kansas will come into the union as a free state. So here Susan B. Anthony meets Frederick Douglass and she's deciding what to do. And there's discussion about the women's rights group and her sister and her mother and her father are quite engaged. Now, Susan B. Anthony was nowhere near Seneca Falls in 1848. It's the greatest error that people make about history. She and Stanton hadn't even met and she wasn't connected with it. What Susan B. Anthony was doing was ramping up with the New York State Anti-Slavery Society to speak and to work to end the institution of slavery. It's not till a couple years later that Amelia Bloomer introduces Susan B. Anthony to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They're 
they're on their way to an anti-slavery convention. And that begins the 50-year relationship that is both fascinating and significant because of the impact that it had and because of the issues that they raised then and that they still raise today for us to address in terms of human rights. Not everybody knows how committed to abolition work Susan B. Anthony was. She said, I'm not a speaker, I'm an organizer. And she is an organizer. She had two nicknames. They called her the general because boy, would she whip the troops into shape and tell you where to go and get it organized. And she was not dealing with a few people or a dozen people or a hundred people or a legion of people, but building a whole army, a whole cohort, cohort across the country of people to organize, agitate and educate so that we could move toward human rights. But they also called her Aunt Susan. To me, that nickname, and they, the same people used it, is a term of affection and endearment. It acknowledges that she was an inspiration and a gentle presence and a loving presence. It also says that she was family. She wasn't a distant icon that they couldn't connect with. So we have Susan, the general, and Susan, Aunt. Susan. Now, lots is being discussed, particularly in 2020, around racism and the suffrage movement. And we have to acknowledge that Susan B. Anthony said some things I wish she hadn't said. In my imagination, Susan B. Anthony would have wanted us to call her out on it, because that is who I believe she was. I'd like to talk for a couple minutes about Susan B. Anthony, and it's interesting. You can read today, and you can tweet, and there's some, there's some, um, there's a lot of stuff that's really junk, and actually isn't accurate. That's getting repeated, but there's also a lot of stuff that we have to look at and be honest about. I suspect that in another five years, we will know as much about Susan B. Anthony's anti-racist work as we are sharing and discovering right now about some of the things that she said that were racist. Who was Susan B. Anthony really? Well, during the Civil War, they suspended the women's suffrage movement and the work for women's rights. And it was actually Anthony and Stanton who gained the signatures, hundreds of thousands of signatures, to help get the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution passed. And I thought I would read for you something from a meeting that they had of the Women's Loyal League. As I mentioned, they'd suspended suffrage and they had gotten together and here at this, and this, because I think this tells you a little bit about Susan B. Anthony. Here she is, and some of the women are saying, well, this war isn't really about slavery. It's really not about the Negro. This is about getting things back to the way they were, right? And she says, uh, there's great fear expressed on all sides, lest this war shall be made a war for the Negro. I'm willing that it shall be. It is a war to found an empire on the Negro and slavery and shame on us if we do not make it a war to establish the Negro in freedom against whom the whole nation, North and South, East and West, in one mighty conspiracy has combined from the beginning. She goes on to critique Lincoln for not acting fast enough and for not moving toward emancipation fast enough and for not pushing for the changes. And she gives a very passionate speech. This is probably my favorite speech of hers and I'll pick up near the end of it. So she says, we talk about returning to the old union, the union as it was, the constitution as it is, about restoring our country to peace and prosperity to the blessed conditions that existed before the war. I ask you, what sort of peace, what sort of prosperity have we had since the first slave ship sailed up the James River with its human cargo and there on the soil of the old dominion sold to the highest bidder We've had nothing but war. When that pirate captain landed on the shores of Africa and there kidnapped the first stalwart Negro and fastened the first manacle, the struggle between that captain and that Negro was the commencement of the terrible war in the midst of which we are today. Between the slave and the master, there's been war and war only. This is only a new form of it. No, we ask for no return to the old conditions. We ask for something better. We want a union that is a union in fact, a union in spirit, not a sham. To me, this speech 
kind of capture Susan B. Anthony's essence and her vision. One of the things that happened right after the Civil War is they convened the Women's Convention, and right away they decided to close the Women's Convention because as they gathered there, now the Women's Convention included Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth and uh, Frances Ellen Harkin, Har excuse me, Harper. Uh, and on the agenda was a resolution proposed by Susan B. Anthony. And the idea was to close the Women's Rights Convention down and launch a thing called the American Equal Rights Association. And the American Equal Rights Association had as its purpose to ask that there be universal suffrage. And they specifically call out and say that there are two of the largest groups who do not yet have the right to vote. And the interesting thing in the wording here is that one of the groups that's named is woman and the other is Negro men. Now it's very interesting in some of the discussions that we have about Susan B. Anthony and her responses that this document, which was presented to Congress, it was sent from the American Equal Rights Association to Congress that's signed by Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, this, it's a very, this powerful document that explains what their stand was and what their belief was at this point in time, specifically says, and let me call up a little bit for this for myself so that I can read it to you uh, because I think it's powerful. Um, the undersigned offers and officers and representatives of the American Equal Rights Association respectfully but earnestly protest any change in the Constitution of the United States, which shall no longer violate the principle of Republican government by prescriptive distinctions and rights of suffrage and citizenship on account of color or sex. We believe humanity is one in all those intellectual, moral, and spiritual attributes out of which grow human responsibilities. They conclude, and it's a wonderful document, uh, woman and the colored man are loyal, patriotic, property-holding, tax-paying, liberty-loving citizens, and we cannot believe that sex or complexion should be any ground for civil or political degradation. In our government, one half the citizens are disenfranchised by their sex and about one eighth by the color of their skin. And thus a large majority have no voice in enacting or executing the laws they are taxed to support and compelled to obey with the same fidelity as the more favored class whose usurped prerogative it is to rule. Your memorialists. So this is Mott and Tilton and Douglas and Stanton and Anthony and others. Especially remember, and I think this is so important at this moment, this is the moment when the United States has come to grips with the horrific sin of slavery and has an opportunity for reconstruction. And they say, our country is still reeling under the shock of a terrible civil war, the legitimate result and righteous retribution of the vilest slave system ever suffered among men, and in restoring the foundations of our nationality, your memorialists most respectfully and earnestly pray that all discriminations on account of sex or race may be removed and that our government may be Republican in fact, as well as form a government by the people and the whole people for the people and the whole people on behalf of the American Equal Rights Association. Now, a lot of the conversations that we're having now are about what happened three years later in the big split in the American Equal Rights Association, when Douglas and Tilton and others had decided that they could get the vote for black men and that it would be ridiculous to attempt to get the vote for women at that point in time. And I am not going to apologize or justify the horrific things that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, but I do understand their outrage. I understand that they thought America had an opportunity to get it right and right away they'd been betrayed by dividing the movement. Every one of us who's ever worked for some kind of human rights or social justice issue knows that the greatest challenge is that question of do you compromise to get what you can today or you, do you hold out until you can get what you want tomorrow? And I think to Anthony who did like Sojourner Truth, say that we oppose the 15th Amendment 
not because of what it does, because we think giving black men is the right thing to do, but because of what it does not do, which is not give black women or women altogether the right to vote. I think if we understand the context of their frustration and their outrage and their disappointment, I think it's flat out wrong to say that Susan B. Anthony was ever opposed to people of color getting the right to vote. I don't think there's any case to be built for that. But I think it's fair to say that in her attempt to suggest that white women who were educated were more qualified than black men who'd been recently emancipated, she said some things that sound pretty darn racist and biased. And we have to deal with that. But I don't think that she ever betrayed the original vision that she had and I think that we will find that she was consistently anti-racist in her lifetime. Even Ida B. Wells Barnett, who in 1895 visited the house on Madison Street, she was there for the dedication of a statue in honor of Frederick Douglass. And she stayed at the Anthony House several times as a house guest. And she writes in her own autobiography about Susan B. Anthony and how she was talking to Susan B. Anthony about some of the things she said and some of the things that she did. Now, let's put that in context. Let's ask Ida B. Wells Barnett what she thought about Susan B. Anthony, because 30 years after that conversation around the 15th Amendment, Susan B. Anthony is telling people to buy the red record and learn about what's happening in lynching in the South. And she's invited Ida B. Wells Barnett to be her house guest because she feels that if we don't again, address the evils and sins of society, we can't become the nation that she would hope we would become. Well, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap this up here and open it up for us to have some discussion. But I think that as we tomorrow have the opportunity to celebrate with Tennessee as they reenact on the floor of the Tennessee House, that famous vote where Harry T. Byrne voted to take the amendment off the table so that we could pass the 19th Amendment. But we have people who will say the 19th Amendment didn't get all women the right to vote. Let's be more accurate. The United mm. States Constitution did not guarantee the right to vote to anyone. It gave that privilege to the states in these United States. The 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment defined some of people. It was the, the uh, 14th Amendment that defined that anyone who was born within these, these shores is a citizen of the country. And it was the women who then said, well, then I'm a citizen. I can claim that right to vote. But the Supreme Court said, no, voting is not a right of citizenship. When the 15th Amendment was passed that said no black man could be denied the right to vote on the basis of race or prior servitude, it also said that Congress could pass laws to make sure that that didn't happen. And the failure within five years after the Civil War was that Congress did not assure that that right that was now guaranteed by the 15th Amendment was protected and preserved. And the Jim Crow laws, including literacy tests and property tests and the horrific abuse of men of color who had a right to vote but were denied it. It was a failure of our nation to protect that right that had now been guaranteed. The 19th Amendment passed, which says that no person can be denied the right to vote on the basis of sex. It gave every woman who was a citizen the right to vote. But it didn't prevent other barriers from being put up by states. It didn't knock down the Jim Crow barriers. It didn't knock down the property laws. It didn't knock down the the horrific tests, and it was still a call for Congress to make sure that that right could be guaranteed for all women. And it really was not until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that we saw that Congress was taking action to assure that the rights that were provided by the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment would be guaranteed. We are celebrating that people, women courageously fought for a right that they addressed a society that believed that women and people of color were somehow less than human and incapable of being a part of those voters who 
it would create a government that would govern themselves. I see this as an amazing accomplishment and celebration and as a huge challenge because Susan B. Anthony's vision for a world that truly would have human rights for all, for a government that would truly take care of its people, a government whose purpose is to assure the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, uh, we are not fully there yet. And so I hope that as the Susan B. Anthony Museum in Rochester shares the story of Susan B. Anthony, we're opening up the discussion that moves us to a new place of how to become a more effective, more humane, more just society in the future. And I hope that this will be a part of the legacy of our 2020 celebration. Thank you, thank you, Deborah. And Jean, do you wanna go ahead with any questions? Well, we are now, I, d I didn't see any written chat questions, did you, Donine? Uh, You're muted, Donnie. Done. Sorry about that. No, I did not see any written questions. So let's open uh, it up. And uh, sometimes we talk over each other, but we'll try and we will give everybody a chance and kind of who gets started first gets first. <laughs> can I can I ask a question? Please. Um. Well, I have two questions, but um, Deborah, tell us about what, you know, we hear about a lot of celebrations being canceled all over the country. I'm not I'm curious what's happening back in Seneca Falls and what uh, the house and the museum are doing this year and this month and to celebrate. Yeah, we, we, we've been planning for 10 years and so much of what, what many groups and organizations were planning were things like, like the Pasadena event. Uh, doing public celebrations that people could come and attend. And uh, I have to say, there's a little bit of depression around all the, sure. the suffrage organizations. Suddenly in August, events are popping up all over the place because people have figured out how to do it virtually. And if you go to the National Women's Suffrage Commission site, there is so much there. The National Women's History Alliance, which had such an important role with Pasadena 2020, has uh, a marvelous set of links to all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, I think that you can do exciting celebrations and learn wonderful new things um, 24 hours a day from, from now to the end of August. Uh, so it's, I think it's, it's very exciting. Tomorrow in Rochester, we're uh, doing a press conference with the mayor and the lieutenant governor, and then some folks are going off to Canandaigua, where, Canandaigua, where they're naming a lane after Susan B. Anthony behind the courthouse where she was arrested for voting in 1872. And I'm doing a leadership conference in Baltimore virtually. Uh, so I, um, there are all kinds of events. If anybody wants to email us, we'll put you on the list. We're sending out a, a daily email of some links that we recommend. Lynn Scher and Ellen Goodman have produced a new podcast. It's called She Votes, The Battle for the Ballot. And uh, I think episode four, um, we're up to episode four, episode five will be released soon. And I highly recommend it. Uh, they're, you know, they're journalists. Because, you know, Ellen Goodman's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And Lyncher knows more about Susan B. Anthony than I think Susan herself did. Uh, I highly <laughs> recommend the podcast. So. Yeah, I'd like to bring something up. This is Martha from the League of Women Voters. And the city of Pasadena is planning an event they're going to launch on August 26th for Women's Equity Day. I will have more information, but I just found out about that. So there's going to be a social media campaign and other things um, in order to, to celebrate. And so I will be able to give you more information. I just found out about it this morning. So as soon as I get more things, I'll be able to share that with you. So City of Pasadena is going to be doing and Martha, you are a speaker in this series. And uh, Carolyn, I think you're introducing Martha. Yes. So that's, we want to look forward to that. Um, yes, and I, I loved uh, Deborah's um, background. All the history is really wonderful. And there's more. Wait, wait till you get here about Susan B. Anthony pledging her life insurance to get women admitted to the University of Rochester. And um, when she was... Um, 
arrested actually for voting, going ahead because women weren't supposed to vote, and she voted. And uh, again, it all goes back to there's so much history in Rochester. The um, uh, attorneys who defended her are still Rochester people. You know, it's all in the air down there. Uh, we have a question. Um, what what is the email address? Donna wants to know what what email address, Donna. If you would like to be added to our uh, suffrage newsletter, you can email pr at susanb.org. So, so P R, oh, but, mm -hmm. and then we'll add you to the um, to the email list. One more time, please. Yes. PR, as in Paul Robert, or public relations, mm -hmm. at Susan B, S U S A N B dot O R G. Great. Oh, and, and just yeah. ask, tell us, tell us why you're emailing, and then we'll put you on the list. And, and Thank we'll you. And Absolutely. any other questions, raise your hand, and uh, then I will, Donnie and I will try and, and uh, see the hand. Talk to the hand. <laughs> I'm not seeing other hands. Um, Is that for real, Gene, or just any of them? No, I didn't. Just, do just that. in. Oh, okay, that's too bad. I have another question then, if nobody else does. Well, okay, someone, just a minute, though. Someone oh, good. Had a question about the link for these other. Uh, these other programs that we've just missed, the three that we've had so far. Can you give that information, Donine? Um, yes. We're putting it on our villagardens.org website under the, and Michelle, you got to help me, under the culture tab, C-O-L-T-U-R-E. Is that right, Michelle? Donine, can I chime in? Yes. Well, I, this is where oh. I'd like to send them, if that's okay, Catherine. Sure, absolutely. Villa Gardens residents right, have yeah. a different link through Life Enrichment, but for people not at Villa Gardens, villagardens.org, and there's a tab that says culture, and if you page down, you'll see a picture of the float and then the five. And so we've downloaded the first two at this point. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. Michelle is, works at Front Porch, and she's been helping me with this. Go ahead. So I'll um, add the link into the chat feature. Um, and right now, um, technically two of the videos are linked there. And once the full program is done, we'll link all five. Um, so please enjoy. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. We can see, see the things. Okay. On YouTube or something. Question? Yeah. What to your Okay. Nan had her hand up. I just wanted to say one thing that you may find interesting again about Stanton and Anthony. Actually, there is a bronze, statue, a bronze statue in Seneca Falls. Somebody is talking over you. I can't hear. Talking. Oh, I'm looking. I just want to tell you now. Stop right away. But there, I just want you to know that there is a bronze statue on the edge of the river in Seneca Falls. And it shows Amelia Bloomer, who of course invented the Bloomer, uh, introducing Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to one another. It's a, a, mm. a, a wonderful, uh, it came in my time. It wasn't there in the beginning, but it's a wonderful, nice symbol. Uh, and there is a uh, 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 symbol in, within, you know, uh, Seneca Falls is the home of the only, um, portion of our parks system where there's a National Women's Historical Park in Seneca Falls devoted to the whole history of suffrage. And uh, that's the only place we have it and it's never funded the way it should be. But there's a marvelous director there. Her name is Andrea Decoder. And you can pull that up online if you look for the whole park uh, system, the national parks. And this is the only one, because you'll find it in Seneca Falls, the National Women's Historical Park in Seneca Falls. And Andrew Decoder is the director of the park. And uh, they have a, a marvelous history. They have memorabilia. They have the place where uh, Alice Paul held out the Equal Rights Amendment uh, for everybody to see. And it's it's a wonderful place to visit. So. Uh, as is the also in the uh, in Seneca Falls is the National Women's Hall of Fame, 
You, which, need, you which, need to take us on a virtual tour, Nan. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be wonderful. That would be. Are there... Are there any, I don't see any hands. Um, can, oh, Irene, did you have a question? No. Um, hey, may I say hand. something? <laughs> may I say something? Yes, oh. please. The second from right key in the top row of your keyboard will increase the volume. <laughs> <laughs> we had quite a bit of chat about, uh, about the being volume. quiet earlier, so. Mr. Spencer, did you have something to say? Uh, You're muted, it seems. Yeah. Hello. Hello. We just wanted to find out, are these being recorded so we can see them later? Yes, they'll be at um, on Villa Gardens website. But for you, Bob, you can also look at the Life Enrichment website that uh, Catherine has set up. She can help you find that. The okay. first two have already been posted and this one will be posted later this week. Very good. Thank you. I wanted to ask Deborah a question, if nobody else. Um, Deborah was, uh, came out from Seneca Falls to walk behind the float. And last week our speaker was Ellen, who also walked behind the float. And I wanted to ask Deborah's experience with being in the parade. Um, some of us, many of us on this call were planners, but we were, did, weren't in the parade. So it's always fun for us to hear each of those individual experiences, if you don't mind sharing. Good one, Donnie. Mm -hmm. I'd love to. My, uh, my wife, Emily Jones, and I flew out together, uh, along with Ann Kuhn, who is a volunteer at the Anthony Museum. And um, the three of us were representing the Susan B. Anthony Museum and House. It, Emily has said it was one of the most memorable experiences of her life. Uh, wow. It was fun to do. Um, it, it was fun, you know, when Nan posited the idea at a gathering of women's leaders out here in, uh, in the Finger Lakes, even before that, and said, what, what do you think about this idea? We all kind of went, well, that's a great idea, Nan, you go. Um, but that you all pulled it off was incredible. I, I, uh, it, was, it was such an honor. I was thrilled to see the diversity in terms of age in, in, in so many ways in those who walked. Um, we, you know, we all had to wear our Edwardian white and our little tennis shoes, um, but we were all very willing to do that. But it, it was such a moving experience. Um, I've marched in many parades, many, many parades, and some have been pretty powerful. But this one, it was so fascinating because as we walked down the streets of Pasadena, people would make eye contact with you. The, the whole row of people would, everyone would make eye contact with you. And from children to, to men, so many people would whisper or shout, thank you. So many people were engaged with this idea of, of voting and what it represented. And you could, it was, it was, it was exciting. It was palpable. It was, there was something almost sacred about it. And yeah, when the firecrackers went out and the Statue of Liberty popped her top, um, I, I was moved to tears. Uh, I, and to me, the reason is because it, it's like where I started with Susan B. Anthony's story. It's about that possibility of really becoming a beloved community, about really bringing together people so that we can, we can take this to, to an even greater place. Um, and it felt so possible, and it was just so unbelievably exciting to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for for sharing that with us. Yeah. And, and I don't know what happened to our screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought it was just me. No. 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 Oh, yes. Is that um, you, Catherine? <laughs> it, it's having a life of its own. Uh, no, yeah. no, that that's not me. But well, let me stop sharing the screen and maybe that, that'll fix it. Unless you're on 45 minutes. And I want to say one thing. No, we have longer time. Whatever okay. a great time it was for me when I got to Pasadena. And I you know, didn't expect to be here at the year of 2020. And here I was all of a sudden. And some of you wonderful Pasadena people said, well, no, we're, not. we're back. <laughs> and, and I said, what a marvelous idea. Because this is the only thing. This is unique. 
that will be seen around the world, as indeed it has mm -hmm. been, and carrying that message. And I still cry. Janine, can I say something? Sure. sure. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, I didn't, I was one of the planners with many of the ladies that were here. <laughs> And yeah, there was it was a lot of work and whether or not it was gonna get done. I think Nan kept saying, you know, we, it'll be done and she was right. But it's nice to hear that side because I haven't heard that side, Donna, of when you were walking. We were so excited when we did the, um, the day before with the judging to see all you guys. I think it really hit us when we took pictures and we were inside the float barn and I was the one that was, you know, going, okay, over here, over here and take the pictures. and. But the fact that, you know, what your experience was to walk, that's just fabulous to hear because we were on the other side and we were so happy and we were so proud. But thank you for sharing that because mm -hmm. it, it yeah. was so worth it. Thank you. And you know, always, the, the one man walking was my son-in-law, Mark. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and we were, they, it's fascinating. Yeah, that's your terrific son-in-law. <laughs> Yeah, he was, and he stood out because he's very six foot four. <laughs> and there's some fun backstories. It, it was so professionally organized. It really was just an incredible experience. And, Thank you for saying uh, that. But, but, but sure some of the backstories, like you know, we were told that yeah, we wouldn't have access to bathrooms. Um, so there are whole stories all of us have about Depends and other things we did to prepare to be on the yeah. bus at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. All that. And uh, I'm sure that I was sitting in the bistro at Villa Gardens after the parade and all of a sudden there are people coming in in white. I'm thinking, <laughs> what is this? Oh my goodness, I knew who it was. And one of the young ladies and a gentleman also sat down in the booth and chatted with me and told about their experiences and it was wonderful. I yeah. couldn't believe it. Yeah, From we were uh, into the bistro. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a gift to have everybody come afterward for, for lunch. Yeah. That, um, yeah, and my my ugly cry through that event tells you how <laughs> <laughs> we were all uh, tired and happy how how incredible it was but I, it is fascinating to me still that there's about 25 of us who worked for the year and a half 18 on the float 100 behind the float you know every single one has stories upon stories to mm -hmm. tell just even your experience deborah that morning in the hotel room probably is a whole story you know yeah of everybody being dressed and gathering being, you know, to two thirty three, whatever it was, to get on a bus to come in the dark to, you know, to Orange Grove Boulevard. And then we won the uh, award there. And but there's a handful of people were there when that happened. But yeah, everybody's got their own their own slant. It's it's really fun for us to hear. So thank you. Well, we were in the little gardens. I I not who you all realize that, but I mean they gave us the support from the beginning. And they gave us the place. They gave they fed all us. They did everything else. And and um, I want all the time to make sure that we give um, Villa Gardens the due that they get need from from this whole there because it wouldn't have happened without them. It right, Janine. Would you sh remind us of the next two speakers and dates on the series, please? So Martha Zavala, who, who spoke up just a little earlier, she's on this call, is the current president of the League of Women Voters Pasadena area. So that'll be uh, next Monday. Well, and then the, on August 24th, sorry. And then the, the final on August 31st, will be Ken Morris. Um, he is the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass and oh. also a descendant of Booger T. Washington. He did ride on the float. He's an amazing presenter. And um, so how exciting to have both of these coming up. So Thank glad you're all here. Invite anybody, we have room. There's not a limit on the Zoom. Please feel free to share this with anybody. And may I then, remind you that there will be the the, per, the the group that started this as donine indicated called it 2020 plus because we want to move on beyond this and so watch for further programming that will come out of this 2020 plus uh, group uh, starting perhaps at the end of september or october and if you're on a list, you will hear, you'll get information about these, but I think you'll enjoy them 
uh, as we move, uh, move ahead. We wanted to give you a, a hook to hold on to because we need that. And so uh, 2020 plus is that hook and we are deciding where that will go forward. It's going to be a really, um, what I'm planning is an international kind of effort. And um, our, our theme will be the same one that Laura Farber so brilliantly gave us for the float, which is hope. And it's hope for the future and hope for the world. And uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to emphasize. But of course, during the end of September and October, nobody's gonna be concentrating on anything except the election <laughs> and the vote. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we understand that. So we're gonna give ourselves time to figure out exactly what we wanna do with 2020 and the plus. And we invite all of you to talk with us and give us your ideas about where we should go. We know that in the future, when she gets that helicopter off in uh, Mars, that Mimi Ang will, will uh, give a, a, a wonderful discussion for us, and we're so blessed Marty, to be. Here. Marty, you have a question. I do. I I I've just I don't know where Villa Gardens is. I'm at Claremont Manor. I'm still in the front porch community. Where I so enjoyed this series. Where are you? We're in Pasadena. Oh, you are in Pasadena. Right. Okay. Okay. So, but I have just enjoyed this series so much. I can't even begin to tell you. Good, hey, Marty. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to and keep coming back. Towards community, so we appreciate you, you sending any of them word about us. And Carolyn, didn't you want to say something? I think your hand was up. Oh, it's. I think it's Loretta. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say what a great series this has been. I want to thank Winnie for letting me know about it. And I also just wanted to share with you all, as you probably know, uh, tomorrow is a huge day in uh, Tennessee. And I happen to have a sister in Nashville. And so I shared with uh, Winnie, and I'm happy to share with um, whomever here on the, the call to get at the broader group, um, a link that my sister sent me of all of the amazing online activities that were obviously were meant to be in person uh, happening in Nashville tomorrow. And there are a huge number of them, including making sure everyone rings their bell. Uh, at a certain uh, time to, to, to um, recognize sort of what everyone did uh, across the country, as I understand, um, on the 18th, but for various reasons did not happen in Nashville. That's a whole story in itself. But um, there's a, you know, you can imagine there's a lot of uh, pride uh, in, in Nashville about having been the, the state that, you know, sort of um, brought the um, yeah. amendment oh. over the finish line. The yeah. 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 Because that young, I they invited me to the react uh, recreation of that a number of years ago. So I was down there sitting when they recreated it, and the young man got up and read the letter from his mother saying, "Be a good boy and vote for this." <laughs> yes, <laughs> what a great young man, huh? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Get the link and to admit how that happened. <laughs> right. Exactly. Everybody listened to their mother. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And it changed history. We like One it. person we <laughs> changed history. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Link to and watch the Tennessee um, information. The oh, I, I have I have something that I'm happy to share um, with um, whomever could get it to the broader uh, group that lists all of these and has links to them. I have it too. Winnie, Winnie already has okay. it. Okay. Um, so, we, so Winnie, maybe you could send it to someone at Villa Gardens who, in case they, they can get it to the yeah. others. You can so also type it in the chat. Or, or, yeah. yeah. Loretta, I think that's a flyer. I'm, so, I'm sorry? Loretta, you could always type. Oh, there. Deborah just put it. Deborah did it. it. Deborah did it. Yeah, it's so if everybody chat. looks in their chat, there's a, a link to Tennessee yeah. Women. Right there. Look in your chat, mm -hmm. very bottom of your screen. Perfect. Well, if you're on iPad, it's somewhere We're all home. <laughs> There's nothing in there for me. But that's okay. You don't see yeah, the chat, I, Roberta? I I I'll share it with you it. later. There's nothing in there for me when I go in there. <laughs> yeah, I actually okay. have something else that was I'll, put I'll together we'll by... Yeah. I have something Maybe else that was business. put together by someone that um, I sent to, to Winnie. Um, it may repeat these things, but it's not a... Uh, it was really just an individual who who puts out her kind of own blog, but was really I thought well done and comprehensive. So uh, great. 
Nancy, if you don't get it, send it to your, send me an email and I'll make sure you do, you know. Thank you all. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy your Thank week. You. Enjoy Bye. tomorrow. Wear white. Wear white. Wear white. That's right. Take, take a picture you. and share. Thank you. Donine. Thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you, you man. Great. Thank you all. Hey, Winnie. Good to see you. Deborah, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah. Oh. You're welcome. Thank you. Now she's on Zoom. <laughs>